try to believe that is it really possible. But arrival at IARI made different. It gave me the identity who I am. And this is the miracle of IARI in me, as far as I'm concerned. IARI began as ARI, Agriculture Research Institute, in Pusa, in Northern Bihar, in 1905. The site was in close proximity to the indigo plantation, which was in need of revival after the German census of Anilin in, in 1899. And the first scientist to be deputed to ARI was the English chemist, you can understand that, John Walter Leather. The Indian Agriculture Research Institute was set up in April 1905, as I said, as ARI, Bihar, with a donation of $30,000 by Henry Phipps, an American chemist and a friend of Lord and Lady Cudlin. And Mr. Fitz laid the foundation stone on April 1st, 1905, for the Agricultural Research Institute in Pusa. In 1907, Mr. Henry Fitz, by the way, Soil Science and Agriculture Chemist in the region, which I will show a picture at the moment, is named after Mr. Henry Fitz. So, Mr. Henry Fitz, the bacteriology unit was established in 1907. And 1911, the name was changed to Imperial Institute of Agriculture Research, IIAR, which in 1919 became Imperial Agricultural Research Institute. And then on 15th of January 1934, unfortunately, the buildings were demolished in Pusa Bihar, and then IARI then known as Imperial Agricultural Research Institute uh, by the Secretary of State was approved to be transferred to New Delhi. And that is where in 1934, uh, uh, approval of the shift to of IAR at New Delhi uh, and the allocation of rupees 3.8 million, that is $53,000 happened. And this is a historical fact, the first director of uh, Indian region, the Indian director was Dr. B. Vishwana, uh, who was the first director uh, when the institute was shifted to Pusa, New Delhi, where you are located. In 28 July 1937, the inauguration of the new campus in Delhi happened, which, uh, as you know, uh, in 7th of November 30, Six was the building was inaugurated by the then Viceroy of India, Lord Lilithgow. And uh, in 1947, then the Imperial Agricultural Research Institute was renamed with its final name, the Indian Agricultural Research Institute, which, as we know it, a very uh, prominent not only an Indian institution, but throughout the world. And in 1963, when I joined, in fact, it was the premier agricultural institute and still maintained its that status as of today. In 1958, it was deemed the university under the University Grants Commission Act of 1956. And in 1970, the original location of IARI in Pusa was converted to what we now know the Rajendra Agricultural University. And uh, the history continues that uh, is an ISO 9001-2015 certified institute, uh, a very prominent indeed. I think it will be appropriate if I mentioned uh, the names of few directors of IARI, 1904 to 1916, it was Dr. Bernard Coventry. Again, his report, I had the chance to read it, uh, about PUSA Institute and its findings, and its adoption by farmers in PUSA uh, is very interesting indeed. The report was given uh, 
an article written by a long-term experiment uh, in India. In 1935 to 1944, the first director, Indian director of the Vishwanath, and of course 1950 to 65, Dr. B.P. Paul, and that's 1965 to 66, Dr. A.B. Joshi. I'm mentioning these two, Dr. Paul and Dr. Joshi, because I was there when they both were director and Dr. Joshi was uh, uh, dean before Dr. Paul when he was the director. And Dr. Swaminathan became director from 1966. And of course, at present, you know, we have Dr. Ashok Martin, to whom I'm very grateful for inviting me to this very auspicious event. What are the challenges facing India's agriculture in the context of IAR? My time, the institution uh, really had to address the question of malnutrition and development. True nutrition sensitive agriculture. IARI has been very pioneering along with many other state agriculture universities and ICNR in promoting the Green Revolution. And India has become a food exporter country, which I'll come to exactly in a few moments. But still, the question of malnutrition and hunger prevails. Therefore, the agriculture has to be more than just the amount. It has to be nutrition sensitive. That's one part. The water quality and renewability is second part that need to be addressed. Air quality and climate change is part in which agriculture has to be made a solution to the environmental issues. And for the one health, the UN Food Summit, and I had four meetings this morning today, just related to the UN Food Summit. One health concept is being promoted as a major priority for agriculture throughout the world. And I would like to discuss that at some length in a moment, which is related, of course, to soil health as well, which is the topic of uh, my discussion. And in the context of uh, alleviating poverty, empowering farmers, and increasing their income, farming carbon, making carbon in soil and trees as a commodity that can be bought and sold and traded as a farm produce is something which is a question of future that needs to be addressed. We talked about farming carbon since about 20 years uh, ago. We had a project uh, done in cooperation with the farm uh, with the Dr. M. Swaminathan Foundation and ICR. Uh, it was funded through Sadhguruji Tata Trust. And we talked about farming carbon at that time. And the question was, when will India be ready to really adopt that as a, a theme, as a commodity, as a produce? that can be bought and sold. And I think the time is now. Indeed, if you look at uh, Secretary Wilson of Agriculture of the US last week, he talked about in his message that farmers should, should be rewarded uh, for carbon sequestration, for making agriculture a solution to climate change. And India has better opportunity to do that than ever, say, the US, because Indian soil have a larger sink capacity for carbon. Oh, India has finite land and water resources and large population of human and cattle together. Yet the Green Revolution transformed India's agriculture. It is one of the greatest success stories. And Dr. Mahapatra, I must congratulate ICR, Dr. Swaminathan, Dr. Paroda, many other scientists who did a remarkable job make Indian agriculture success story. For example, the land area, next stone area, has stayed since 70 the same. Indeed, there is no place uh, to expand agriculture. Uh, but the growth zone area, because of the multiple cropping, has progressively gone up. It's almost uh, uh, 200 million hectares at the moment, which is a tribute to the farmers and the research scientists and the expansion uh, through ICAR. The irrigated land area, again, a remarkable success story, expanding from 30 million hectares 
to 70 million hectares. But most of it is, uh, except for maybe 6 million hectares, most of it is under flood irrigation. That means there's a lot of scope for improvement. Fertilizer increase. Ghana, they are a factor of more than 12. And India now uses as much as 180 kilograms per hectare, more than that in the United States. But there is a question of efficiency. So irrigation fertilizer uh, is a great success story compared to, for example, in South Saharan Africa and elsewhere in the developing countries, including the Caribbean and Central America. But the efficiency, eco-efficiency, and the soil quality and the land health uh, are important issues which we need to know. So the success story is also shown here. The grain production went up by a factor of six between 1947 and 2020. The horticulture production went up by a factor of 10, 320 uh, million tons. Milk production went up by a factor of nine. Again, India is the largest milk producer and second largest uh, vegetable and fruit producer. Fish production went up by a factor of almost 13. And there are many other commodities. India has done really a remarkable an exemplary, a unique success. And IARI, ICAR, and ICR funded other universities and institutions really have to be saluted, congratulated, complimented, and commended for making us, me, and our lives a proud, a proud uh, inhabitant native of India because of your success, because of the remarkable progress that you made. India now exports to. 20 million tons, 40 billion dollars worth. Grain prefer stock, 50 million tons of grain. Poverty, uh, it's still there 20%, but in the uh, 50s, uh, 60s, it was 70%. So we have a more challenges. We certainly have no reason for complacency, but the success thus far is something to be proud of. Unique history. Uh, unique accomplishment, commendable achievement and need. But there are concerns, and those concerns need to be addressed. And India has the capacity to do it. IERI and ICER have certainly uh, uh, capabilities and commitments and strategic plan to do that. And I think this is a time to renew those commitments. The Green Revolution was serious centric, rice and wheat, obviously. It was based on intensive inputs of fertilizers, pesticides, irrigation, energy, monoculture. Those were the needs of the 60s, definitely. They were needed. But right now we got to look back again, revisit them, and see how we can improve upon those things. Uh, it was driven by subsidies and procurement. Can we change those subsidies and procurement to something else, which is more pro farm and pro-nature and pro-food. And those policies are fairly ripe for debate, rediscussion, and the environmental degradation. Something that we have to take care of. We have the capacity to do it. And I think this is a good time to make a plan to restore degraded soil, to recharge our groundwater resources, and to improve the quality of water, air, and landscape of beautiful India. And we can do that. The lockdown during uh, COVID 2020 in April, May, it showed how beautiful the main this water was, how beautiful the air quality was in Delhi. I hope we can do that always, ever, the way it was during the lockdown period. We also have need to uh, adopt agriculture which is negative emission agriculture. I think it's a question of semantics. Some people call carbon. Uh, zero agriculture or carbon negative agriculture, I think that can be confusing because agriculture must produce carbon. That is the idea between food and production. That photosynthesizing atmospheric CO2 into green, into quality food. So it has to be very highly positive carbon agriculture. But it is a negative emission agriculture. The emissions from agriculture have to be negative. That's a question of semantics, but as I have clarified, the idea to reduce carbon emission from foreign fish. By no tail, by improving fertilizer use efficiency, by restoring soil health, 
by increasing the productivity so that the elite varieties, which we have many, going back to 60s, since the 70s and more wheat and the other rice varieties, um, we, it's a question of how to make sure that their potential is achieved, harnessed, uh, realized to the greatest extent because they are grown under ideal soil and climate and water conditions. We have discussed the carbon industrial ecosystem in soil, in trees, in uh, wetlands, uh, in mine lands, and in many other degraded lands and ecosystems, uh, which India is blessed with a lot of resources where carbon has been depleted and it can be put back into the soil. I would like to show an example of what a good soil is. Here is an example of a healthy soil which has an organic matter content of about 4 to 5 percent. Uh, the soil is full of living organisms, about uh, 4 to 5 metric ton per hectare, lot of root biomass, lot of biotic activity. A healthy soil does not require pesticide. It's a disease suppressive soil. Uh, soil organic matter content, which is the ingredient of uh, healthy soil is really essential to the basic ecosystem services. Water quality and quantity, the climate change adaptation mitigation, food quantity and quality, the above ground and biodiversity. In fact, if I can put it in simple words, soil organic matter content is the heart of soil health. And unfortunately, obstructive farming practices uh, which is due to resource for farmers and sometimes uh, because the technology is not available and I'll talk about that in a moment, uh, organic matter content of soil of India is depleted to less than 45 percent. Some soil of northwestern India may be even as low as 0.1 percent or 0.2 percent. So there's a tremendous need, strong uh, requirement, absolute necessity to restore organic matter content to the soils of India. One other reason to restore soil organic matter content, and we have been talking about this in the UN Food Summit meetings, including today, is the fact that the health of soil, plants, animals, human, environment, and the planet is interconnected. And the health of the soil goes down you saw the dust storm, you saw the flood, you saw the erosion problem. The health of everything else depends on it. And when people are desperate that they take away everything from the land and land does not get its share, then land reciprocates. And land reciprocates to give its misery through poor production and poor nutritional quality and poor ecosystem services for humanity. And this vicious cycle has been broken by restoring degraded soil and improving soil health. Human health, and that is exactly the point was pointed out today in the UN Food Summit, is a fingerprint of soil health. And it can only be improved by restoration of soil health of degraded, polluted, and contaminated soil. So they have to have really very high priority and restoration of soil organic matter content to above the threshold range, 3%, 4%. Uh, in drier climate, Rajasthan, southern Haryana, uh, part of Delhi, uh, and the other region of the drier climate, maybe not, but I'll talk about how to do in those climates as well in a moment, how to improve soil health. We have the mulch we are talking about may not be available. And this soil health part is very, very critical to human diet, malnutrition, and the hunger that we talked about. Going back to Veda, when diet is wrong, medicine is of no use. And when diet is correct, medicine is of no need. That's really a very, very basic philosophy. The heart, the soil, and diet and environment go, go together. Consumption of healthy and sustainable diet, coarse grains, pulses, vegetables, nuts, seeds, and of course, occasionally, some good meat as well, uh, moderation, 
these things are absolutely essential to cook the health of And they are also essential to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. They also improve water resources and the strength and biodiversity. It is a win, 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 win option. Something very critical. Good diet. And a good diet means good soil health. There's going to be a problem as the CO2 concentration goes up and the crops with allergic regions and other safari RI and ICR obviously know about this very well indeed. Uh, there's a dilution effect in nutrients. Nutrition quality can decrease because of increase in production by inputs of fertilizer, CO2 fertilization effect. And therefore the plant breeding itself has a major role to play, and not just the soil. So soil in the context of holistic approach. Uh, the focus is shifting to improving and sustaining soil health in relation with improved varieties and other management practices. Management of natural resources in a very judicious and prudent manner indeed. The, in terms of nutrition security, India does have some issue of micronutrient deficiency. Children are especially vulnerable to deficiency of zinc. Iron deficiency causes anemia in young mothers and children. A very serious issue. 17 micronutrients essential to human health. Many of our degraded soil are devoid of, or depleted of, short of these micronutrients. And therefore, the produce grown on those soils is also deficient in those micronutrients. Seven micronutrients are also are not always available, and many of them essential for uh, human health. So 22 micro and macronutrients, and these must be supplied through the soil. Why? Going back to the One Health concept. I think IARI should have a class on One Health concept. Uh, the idea is to have uh, uh, people dealing with uh, human nutrition, uh, people dealing with human health, uh, people dealing with the veterinary health, people dealing with plant health, and those dealing with soil health, all work together to teach a class, a joint class, a multidisciplinary class. I think it would be an ideal thing to do. Therefore, sustainable soil management uh, always implies whatever you take from soil with to remove and understand what changes are happening and how those changes can lead to change in the soil and environmental quality. Uh, the goal is not to keep dumping water and chemicals and flowing, but use them judiciously. Save the land for nature. Save water for nature. Uh, COVID-19 has taught us to make sure that we do not overreach nature. Leave share of land as much to nature as possible. I give the example of Shivalik Hills and other steep slopes. Leave them under permanent cover and that will use the agriculture as well. That brings me to the uh, concept of, uh, of what the agriculture should be. Regenerative agriculture, obviously. And regenerative is not a one technology. There's no universal panacea. There's no such thing that conservation agriculture will work everywhere. Regenerative agriculture is very site specific. And it is characterized by the fact that the soil quality, environment quality, water quality, biodiversity is restored over time through agricultural practices. That is essentially what it means. It is a green economy, circular economy, based on recycling, continuous soil cover, less soil disturbance, integrated nutrient management, not just chemical fertilizer, but integrated, including compost, manure, green manure, recycling, and complex rotation. Uh, not just rice wheat, but long-term complex rotation, integration of crop with trees and livestock, and restoring soil organic carbon content, producing more from less. Less is better. Good. Less is better. Less is always better. Improve the efficiency. So it's not adding more chemical, but the idea is to improve the efficiency. And the system-based regenerative agriculture reconciles the need to produce adequate and nutritious food with the necessity of restoring the environment. They go together. It's not just producing more agricultural quantity. It is the environment as well. 
So if we were to reduce the production by 5%, maybe even 10%, and save water, such as in direct seeded rice, or save fertilizers, and then have less wasting, we have a wastage of 30 to 40 percent in grain and in fresh produce, even more than 40 percent in fresh produce. If we use properly what we produce, we don't have to produce that much. Instead, restore the environment. And this is what is called eco efficiency, eco intensification. Remember, I used the word eco intensification. I did not use sustainable intensification, eco. Eco means ecological integrity, maintenance, and producing more from less. The idea is not to maximize the production, the idea to optimize and sustain production while restoring the environment, while restoring the environment. Environment becomes critical. That brings me to the question I mentioned carbon carbon. Making carbon a farm commodity, just like we grow corn, maize, wheat, rice, barley, soybean, chickpeas, milk, poultry. We can also talk to farmers and explain them how to grow carbon and how to sell that carbon in a commodity to the industry, to the environmental uh, consumers. So it's a growing carbon as a farm commodity that can fetch money and income to the farmer. And how much income? Real price. This societal price. In the US in 1999, 2000, there was a startup for called Chicago Climate Exchange. The price of carbon credit, which is one ton of CO2, went up to about $4 to $5 per ton and collapsed to about 20 cents a ton. That is not the real price. The real price is what are the ecosystem services it could be. I was very impressed to read an article about Britain just yesterday. The article said, if we can return 20% of the land back to nature, the ecosystem services produced by that land under nature is worth more, much more than the agriculture produce. I think same thing with the Shivalik steep hills and elsewhere uh, degraded land, if they can be put back to nature, where the ecosystem generated in terms of climate change adaptation mitigation, flood control, drought resistance, water quality, recharge of water table, the biodiversity, the minimization of the incidence of COVID-19, many ecosystem services, aesthetic values, environment for human health, much better. And for that we should provide farmers. Reward farmers for $65 per hectare, $26 per acre, uh, and this is the price I've been suggesting for the U.S. How much it could be for India? I think I see our scientists uh, are fairly better knowledgeable uh, than what I would be, but I still think Indian farmers should be given somewhere about 1500 to 2000 rupees per acre per year for sequestering carbon at a rate, for example, of one third to half a ton of carbon per hectare per year. If the farmers are paid that, not as a subsidy, but as an ecosystem services compensation and provide them the facilities how to manage the crop residue and other resources, maybe the environment restoration to mulch farming and conservation tillage can happen. <coughs> the drought and flood, I showed you the picture of flood in Bihar and elsewhere and drought also in Chirakundi and elsewhere. The drought and flood are the two sides of the same coin. And the coin in this case happens to be land and soil. Flood is caused by land misuse. And when the flood is gone, coin turns around and it becomes a drought, which is soil mismanagement. Flood and drought are the two sides of the same coin. Look at it and you will understand what I mean. Flood during the rain, even 500 inches in Serapunji, and when that rain is not preserved properly, managed properly, the drought. 
The solution is long term. It's not going to happen overnight. It will take a generational scale, 20 to 40 years, to rehabilitate, reforest, to rejuvenate the vegetation, which has been denuded. But there is no alternative. There is no choice. And India can be a leader in that, in all aspects, much more so than any other country. Something to plan about. If we could have a combined where the residues, uh, I think I'm called a happy cedar, works very well. Uh, this is an example which is a uh, John Deere planter. It requires much bigger horsepower, but then number of rose planters is also greater. But that's the way to go. The proper residue left on the soil, even on steep slope, including those in the eastern uh, Ohio, which slopes are 7 to 10 percent. Uh, there is no runout because of the infiltration rate under this kind of coverage is very good. Then I wanted to mention about the drier climate, Rajasthan, part of Haryana, other drier parts of India. Crop residue is not available. How do you make a mulch? I was visiting uh, uh, Kajri uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, I uh, know that Dr. Yadav and others uh, are going to be speaker with me for the, uh, one of the summit coming up uh, next month. And I was very impressed with the way uh, things were done at the uh, Lyland Institute there. Uh, but here is an example of gravel mulch. And uh, this gravel mulch is a very good measure for weed control. Uh, one supply to a depth of four inches, for example, it's not going to go anywhere. All the rain, even if it's a 200 millimeter or 300 millimeter will soak into the soil and uh, you can plant any crop. Here uh, is an example of uh, sunflower, here is an example of melons, and uh, I am told uh, uh, melons produced under this kind of condition in a rainfall of 300 millimeter. And that's excellent quality. In fact, the price of melon produced from there is as good. And this gravel mulch, even with irrigation, a uh, drip irrigation, uh, as you can see, uh, this is a drip irrigation program. You can see the drip line uh, is ideal. And many times I was wondering, gee, can you grow wheat? You certainly can. No wheat control required. Uh, seeding drill done properly, and the fertilizer drill if needed along with it. And if necessary, some uh, irrigation also possible. So I think there are innovations that can happen. And uh, this innovation is something uh, that we really have to plan and think ahead. A 300 millimeter rainfall, and you can produce excellent crops by gravel mulch. If you go back to the literature, going back to Israel and other drier climate, gravel mulch should be mentioned. And there is no reason why uh, the Western uh, India and other part of India could not look at this possibility technology. Elsewhere, compost. Uh, recycling of biomass in India does have it, rather than burning it. Just like I showed the bailing, uh, let's try to develop uh, uh, composting facilities in the countryside, everywhere. Uh, even biodigester uh, possible. Uh, in the winter part, that may be difficult, but composting, definitely. A lot of, uh, including in the cities, certainly something that um, must get a very good attention of uh, Rather than using chemical fertilizer, combining together the chemical fertilizer as well as compost. Uh, again, these are some of the composting facilities at Ohio State, uh, where even some small calves, when they die, happen to die, and you bury them in this kind of compost, in two, three weeks, even they disappear. They become part of the uh, compost. Uh, a very good opportunity to develop those kind of facilities and do a lot of research. You want to make sure that the water coming out of the composting pad goes through some kind of recycling wetlands, for example, so that uh, the pollutants do not enter the groundwater or the surface water. So development of composting facility would be uh, a great idea. Then soilless agriculture, protected agriculture, greenhouse agriculture, some kind of uh, uh, cover where uh, vegetables can be grown uh, most of the time, uh, is an alpha the protected agriculture in dry desert uh, 
including in the desert area. Uh, excellent, feeding the entire Europe because of the protected agriculture. And the sky farming. Uh, from that point of view, if I may suggest uh, for Dr. Ashok Kumar Singh, to Dr. Karnoche Mahapatra, uh, the DDG, Dr. Tia Sharma, and other colleagues and friends, some of the strategic goals to think about uh, can IARI become, should become, how to make it among the top 100 agricultural universities of the world? Have a plan. Why not? If we have a goal, we can achieve that. And IARI has certainly capability and history to do that. Let's put that in our strategic plan. Can we create centers of excellence? And what that means is excellence in every sense, in terms of the research quality, in terms of the productivity, uh, and center of excellence could be on conservation agriculture, on mitigation and adaptation of 